Welcome, everyone. Um, just for some quick description, self-description, I am a black person with a shaved head wearing a floor-length floral gown and white tennis shoes. Um, this stock was interesting for me because uh, I am a member of the disability community, but I'm also uh, connected to the care community around people with disabilities through my mother. Um, and it really sort of forced me to confront a lot of uh, the things that I had thought about um, having been exposed to that at a young age and, and, and being an independent person myself. Um, and so there were three things specifically that really caught my eye. And I'm curious, Nick, um, from your perspective, how these things or their definitions might have changed for you. The concept of communication, agency, um, and consent. Um, I imagine you started this with a definition for all of those things. It probably evolved as you were working on this. Um, did it? And if so, did that impact you know, your approach and in what ways? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, before, before I answer, I just wanna um, just welcome formally the, the Johnson family for being here. Um, but not, not just for being here, but for um, going on this journey um, that started before I came along and uh, sharing it with me and letting the world see it and then participating in, this is the first screening we've all been at together. Uh, we've watched it together, but this is the first public screening that we've, we've been at together. So I just wanna thank you guys for your courage in every part of that process. Um, so thank you. Um, so so uh, let's see here. So I, there was a, a quite a, quite a, um, a detailed article that was written in 2015, which is how I found out about the, about the story. And uh, I was immediately interested because I have an uncle who um, had a uh, intellectual disability. He was diagnosed, he was 65, he actually passed uh, during COVID, of COVID. But he was diagnosed at a time where there was no real specificity to diagnoses for somebody like him. It was, you know, uh, the R word was thrown around and it was not looked at much more than that. And he was put in a group home and he lived with 10 people and then he lived with five people and then he spent the last 20 years with these three three guys. Um, and, uh, you know, he was always fascinating to me. I grew up, I was very close with him. I was, a, uh, from when I was a young kid, I was aware of his, um, the, both the way he appeared to the world and, and what I knew about him. So I sort of was, you know, very early on to sort of uh, have the experience of being on both sides of, of that, sort of within the family and being on the outside and sort of gazing in. And as a child, I was curious. I thought he had an amazing laugh. I thought he had, an, uh, you know, he had an incredible memory. He would remind uh, our family of things that happened during a fishing trip, you know, 30 years ago that nobody else could remember. Um, there were other parts of the way he expressed himself that were um, much more rudimentary, you know, and uh, we loved him and accepted him for who he was. So um, this story, uh, I felt like, what I really wanted to capture just as um, from the outset was not somebody that was coming in saying like, oh, I know, I know what happened here and I know better than, than anybody and here's what I'm going to tell. It was really to sort of, um, as I said, go on a journey with the family and, um, and to sort of kind of start from the same place that, that you did. You know, there was the curiosity about uh, Autism is a World, the film, which I was also curious about and the kind of... Um, incredible feeling uh, which I, I had in that same moment of, oh, what if we can do more for this, for this person? And um, uh, as a loving family member, being able to relate to that desire to do everything you can for your, your family member, for your, for your son. Um, in my case, my uncle, my, my, my mother's brother, in their case, uh, their son and brother. But um, so the journey only gets more complicated 
from there. Um, and um, I think that this question of consent, which is at the heart of the film, is the one that is, I think, the one that lingers on probably uh, for the audience most prominently. Um, people have told me they go out to dinner after and have arguments uh, over dinner uh, about it. But I think that in a world where, I mean, this is like a four hour answer and I want, I want you guys to sort of join in on this, but I think that um, on the one hand, consent is very simple. On the other hand, it's very complicated. Um, it's when you start to understand um, <laughs> because it's it sort of consent is at the intersection of not just our self-determination, but also the support and the trust that we need to have for the people around us that are offering us that support and trust. And if that's not there, or if someone is taking advantage of that, then self-determination quickly becomes victimized. And I think that trying to find that line is incredibly hard with um, somebody who can't speak. And um, finding that line became, took a long time, I think. And I think that there were so, so many ethical questions that, that came up along the way. Um, around power and the power dynamics of the relationship, uh, um, uh, the working relationship, which was just starting off about, you know, of, of, as a training method to, to try to help him speak, which everybody was on board with, and then it became something else, um, which, was, which was private. And it gets into questions of guardianship as well, which is, um, you know, the, the sort of the legal system's attempt at trying to both, um, provide agency, but also protection. Um, and everything in between, and it's all imperfect, and we do our best. And, um, <laughs> and so for me, um, it's, it's almost like from there you jump out, in my view, to how is a culture, like where we place value and where we place our attention and where we place our priorities and um, you know I don't see people with Derek's specific disabilities on the screen very much I don't think that many people in mainstream America does there's a question of do you just avoid it because it's too complicated or meaning no one ever gets to sort of contemplate and and think about um, the sort of complexity of what it is to, 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 to try and understand him and to, to try and understand what it is to be his family, uh, doing the best for him, you know? Um, and, um, but, but it's like, as a culture, like, he's still fairly on the periphery of where we put a lot of our money, attention, our science, our all this stuff, our support, our social uh, support, our um, all of these things. So it's, uh, you know, our tech, our, the technology that's dedicated, right, to, to helping him have the best life that he can. So all, all of these things are, it's like we're so far from where we will be in 30, 40 years, but we are here right now and we're, we're working with, um, a lot of imperfect systems, which frankly, you know, Daisy and John could talk way more to about what it's like to, to get money from the state and, and enroll Derek in classes and make sure that he's around people that you trust him to be around when he's not with you. And, um, you know, what that feels like. I mean, I, I, my mother was in charge of that with my uncle. I didn't have to do those things. I was a child. So, um, you know, that, and, and, and the degree to which you felt supported in that endeavor. I think that those are the questions about, you know, where uh, we prioritize um, our efforts as a, as a culture and where, where we put our money and where we put our uh, efforts. And um, 
and who are we listening to when we build those systems? You know, are we listening to the families? Are we listening to intellectuals? Are we listening to theorists? Are we listening to scientists? Are we listening to the people themselves? Um, and it's a different answer in, in, in a lot of different situations and in every country, you know, they, they also approach it differently. So I, for me, it's just, it, it's a thing that it, it raises more questions than I think there, there are answers to. But I, I, I think that, the idea of how how much uh, you know Daisy and John felt supported um, in their effort to give Derek the best life, you know, is a question they they can obviously answer better than I can. So I would sort of I, I'm curious about that uh, if if I can hand it over. Um, to, yeah, yeah, absolutely. If they would like yeah. to answer that. Well. Is that <laughs> I'm sure it's a short answer. I'm yes. <laughs> yes. When the doctors first told me that Derek wouldn't live past three years old, that hurt my heart, that I, I had to deal with that. And taking him to specialist after specialist after specialist, it became um, a chore. And the only one that I had to really depend on as I took, drove him to and from the doctor was my son, John. And then when he started seizuring, I didn't know what the seizures were. I didn't know what they looked like. It was, he was trembling, his eyes was going back. And then I said, we gotta take him to the hospital. What's going on with, it? with my baby? I don't know. And then I met this doctor in Martland Medical Center. And he told me that your son is having seizures. And there's a man that I know personally. He will give you proper medication for him. And his name was Dr. Seymour Charles, who has long gone. And I was like, OK, John, what do we do? And he said, go see the doctor. And John was only a few years <laughs> older <laughs> than Derek. And I went to Dr. Charles in Union. And he told me, he said, yes, he's having seizures. What type of seizures? I don't know. We have to put him in the hospital and see. But he said, meantime, give him phenobarbital. What's phenobarbital? I don't know. The medication to stop the seizure. And with the advice that Dr. Charles told me and what he told me to do, and he said, give him vitamin D, vitamin C. That will help him. That will help control some of them. And he says, you know, it's your faith. It's your love that you will be able to manage and take your child, take care of him. So that's what I did. And at that time, back then, they didn't have schools. They had early interven intervenes for the babies, but it was only limited. Then I was like, I have to work. How will we have to do it? Then I found this young lady that she would keep Derek and do what she could do for him. And if he had a seizure, she would call me. And here I leave work, go home and get him. And it was trite traumatic. And then we went through finding a place for him, someone, or they had kindergarten, but they didn't have the kindergarten for the disabled. They did not have that. And so we did the best we could. I met this lady that knew somebody. And she said, come on, bring your baby here. We <laughs> keep him a couple of hours. I said, really? She said, yeah. So off the books, she would tell me, bring him in. Now, he can't take public transportation or anything. And she allowed Derek to come to the Head Start program. And he was the first baby, they said, that had to come with a specialized high chair. 
They didn't, you know, the other kids was walking, doing what they had to do, talking and all that. Derek sat up in a high chair, his own special high chair from home. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of trying to get help and trying to get facilities for my son. And that was 35 years ago, about, mm -hmm. right? It was five or six, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's not a very long period of time, so you have to, oh, sorry. It's just, I, 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 it wasn't to interrupt, it's just it, back to the sort of idea of what is available to us and how does, where does the culture place its priorities, right? This is, you know, um, there were less choices then. Yes. And there are more now, but 30 years is like nothing, right? So uh, we're, we're, yeah, and we've gone through, you know, three major cultural movements in the last 10 years, right? So uh, things are evolving uh, at a rate, but, but this was kind of like, he was a pioneer as a, as a child with a, a wheelchair in this Head Start program, right? Right. At the time, which- and it wasn't a wheelchair, it was a scroller because we didn't, we couldn't afford yeah, yeah, wheelchair. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, also, right, exactly. <laughs> so there wasn't even the support to provide a wheelchair, yeah. I just wanted to jump in because we're short for time. Uh, yeah. And I wanted to make sure that everybody got a chance to, to speak. Um, is there a particular question? I'm sorry. I mean, I'm just. That's okay. The original question was about the definition of communication agency um, and how those things might have changed. I mean, it's for you, it's different because you went through this. Yeah. Um, so if you want to just talk about that. Yeah. It's, it's hard to kind of give it a definition. Um, I think we, all, we can all appreciate that um, there is no one disability. Like, I think people have it in their mind what a disability is um, based on any number of stereotypes folks see out there. Um, but it ranges. Um, and, and with that comes the challenge of communication. Um, I guess for me, when I approached Anna Stubblefield about FC, it was about trying to figure out if Derek can communicate to me about if he was in pain. Because, you know, we have a cousin in South Carolina um, who is autistic um, and has um, congestive heart failure. And so he's in a predicament where, you know, he can only, he can't even lay down to sleep, right? Because um, if he does, it can have certain consequences. And so for me, my fear, you know, even given all of the supervision that we provide Derek in, being so attentive to all his needs, if he has a headache, um, we know he might, you know, um, you know, he might make a certain sound or display a certain thing, but what if he has a tumor? What if he, there's some, some kind of pain that he can't um, manifest in any kind of physical way and we can't really understand it? And so we're in this position where we have to be hyper vigilant in terms of how we um, read his behaviors and whether or not he changes his uh, mood on any given day. Um, and so I just really wanted that, really a, a sense of, you know, can you tell us what's, what's going on? Um, as things unfolded, um, it's, again, we're kind of back at that space. Um, but I think, you know, through the years, I mean, even over the course of um, that ordeal and the trial. <laughs> I mean, we had some, uh, sometimes Derek had to go to the hospital for various conditions. Um, and again, God bless us, you know, God has been great to us. We've been able to deal with them and get them the medical assistance. It just so happens my wife is an ER physician. And if, you know, uh, you know, if any question came up, yeah, we know what this is. And, you know, we can get the help that we need. And it's just the way things worked out, you know, things have worked out. Um, communication is difficult, but I think, to Nick's point, we have to, as a society, find ways of empowering families to be, um, feel comfortable in knowing that they can address the needs of their child, cause I don't, their children and their loved ones, because I don't think we do enough of that. I think we, and there's this balancing act, I'll be honest with you, you know, we, we want to defer to the experts, but I think we all have to also recognize that we all know our, ourselves and our children and our family, not family members and our loved ones, we have to, um, feel empowered enough to do that. Um, and therein comes that issue of power, right? Um, I'm also mindful that there's 101 things on the internet. <laughs> so much of it is trash. Um, and so trying to sift through 
to find the correct things because as in, in our case, you know, I was in a collegiate classroom, you know, I was getting my PhD at one of the best universities in the country um, and not being fully aware of facilitated communication. Um, you know, it's not a recognized science amongst uh, a number of organizations. Um, but I think to some of the folks' points, it, it just didn't work for Derek, right? Um, it wasn't something that could work for Derek. And, and that's okay, we, we, we have to figure that out. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the film, again, we've had to deal with it and live with it. So, I mean, I don't, the only thing that has changed is again, I think embracing disability in ways that I don't think we did before, if that makes sense. Thank you. And I think, in, yeah, just in terms of the the consent question, I think is the the long answer that I started is it's related in the sense of ascertaining consent is different for everybody, and it also requires different mechanisms for everybody. Communication. Right. Yes. So it's not um, as simple as, you know, this is consent and this is not. I think it's obviously way more complicated than that. And this is a very extreme way of looking at that question, which I think is complicated for us all, which is very interesting to me about, you know, that was always what was interesting about the story. What does it tell us about ourselves as much as what we're seeing on the screen? I think there's a lot. Right. Yeah. We are out of time, but Mark, I want um, you to be able to um, put in maybe your two cents here if you, if you have a, a moment and a reflection on this. Um, I, yeah, I, I, it's, I, I had the privilege of sitting behind you all and watching you watch this with folks. And I, one of the things that was so fascinating for me as a disability rights advocate and a, a former sex crimes prosecutor, <laughs> so I had this interesting oh, perspective, wow. uh, was that we're all having conversations about you, Derek, and and it, it's like life imitating art, imitating life, you can't, tell us what you think about these conversations that we're having about you. And, um, but I will say one thing, that uh, if there's one thing that Derek knows, it's that you all uh, love him and try to do everything you could as best you could, and, and, and that's a beautiful thing. So I'll leave it at that, okay? Thank you. And I think... This conversation can go on, and I'm so grateful for all of you being here and being so open to this conversation. Um, unfortunately, we do have another film starting here and right now. Um, and uh, I want to thank you all for being a part. I want to thank uh, Abby for leading this conversation and getting it started. Um, folks, coming can we, up right can we, now. Daisy would just room. very quickly like to just introduce and draw attention to the two other members in the audience. That's all. Not, not for questions, but just to. Yeah. Oh, first of all. I want to thank the three beautiful women there. My beautiful daughter-in-law, Lauren. <laughs> Annette Smith, who has a daughter, Tiffany, who has multiple disabilities. Her and Derek grew up together. You probably, you know, wondered who, who he is, but she's going to be his wife. <laughs> right. And Ms. Gloria Reed, who has been the caregiver for Derek for the last 15 years. And she is excellent. And it's very hard to find a caregiver that could really communicate and understand what Derek's wants and what his needs are. Trust me, it's very difficult. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here.